June 12, 2025, at exactly 12.07 p.m. A 40-year-old Soviet fighter jet, the MiG-29. During the afternoon, it took off from the runway. And as soon as the landing gear retracted, the jet nose pointed straight up at an altitude of 12 meters. The MiG-29 Fulcrum C revved its RD-33 engines, which were as taut as steel inside the pistons, to full thrust. As the green light on the trembling concrete runway flashed, the two GBU-62 JDAM-ER missiles bolted to the underside of the wings, shifted, and the fighter jet burst into the sky, slicing through the air. The MiG-29 was loaded with all its ammunition, flying low toward Kursen and taking great risks for secrecy. The jet was flying so low that at some points it was virtually invisible, but in the visible part, the Ukrainian Air Force had everything ready. The targets had been identified, and they were just waiting for the moment when the bombs would explode in Kyrgyzstan. The rough outline of the operation seemed simple. The target line was only 67 kilometers away from the MiG's takeoff line, but the flight geometry of the bombs, the Russian S-300 radar, the Tor M2 picket, the Kreska jammer, and the electronic fog over Dnipro meant that it was a flight between life and death. This was not a flight plan, but a wish for survival because the S-300 batteries, Tor M2 pickets, and Casta 2E radars lined up in the air corridor in front of the MiG could see everything, but they would never understand the digital cunning of a zip-tied iPad. If the pilot delayed climbing by three seconds, the 48 N6 missiles would bloom like concrete in the Kursen sky. If he executed the pickle maneuver precisely on time, two smart bombs worth $650,000 would leave Russia with a $104 million dark gift. So the MiG's target was quite critical. If everything went according to plan, three minutes later, the JDAM ER bombs would reach their target without a hitch. Before we start, to support us and help block Russian bots attack, please subscribe to our channel, like our videos, and turn on notifications us. The RD-33 engines were whistling with 18,000 LB of thrust, and the HUD in the cockpit was streaming mission parameters line by line. The MiG designers hadn't heard of GPS in the 1980s, so a silver-banded iPad Mini, squeezed into the seat, was injecting data into the JDAM ER software via a USB CAN converter, forcing the RSBN5 radio navigation system to receive fake GPS signals. Zip ties served as needles to hold this electronic Frankenstein together. The first obstacle to the operation was a geographical blind spot called the radar horizon. An object flying 20 meters above the ground is visible only 24 kilometers ahead of the radar beam. MiG-29 pilots accepted this physical reality as armor and glided with their noses grazing the treetops, combing the wheat beneath the jet wash with a giant comb. This gave the MiG-29 incredible stealth. In the late 1960s, both the US and the USSR witnessed the doctrinal advantages of the supposedly outdated light and highly agile fighter jets in the skies over Vietnam and learned the bitter lesson that large missile trucks were not the future of air combat, as they had expected. However, Ukraine was now flying these jets to shake up the Russians in Kherson. Designed to counter jets like the Sukhoi Su-27, McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle, and General Dynamics F-16 Fighting Falcon, the MiG-29 had truly taken on an important mission. One of the 1E600 MiG-29s in the world, this Ukrainian jet used in the operation had a silent RWR panel. This indicated that the S-300 batteries had not yet activated their strobed mode. While 36 kilometers behind the border, the pilot locked the throttle at 97% as the Climb Arm command flashed on the bottom line of the HUD. There were three words on the communication screen. Climb, toss, survive. The RD-33 switched to afterburner, and the MiG roared into the sky. Altimeter 1400, 2200, 3800, 5100 feet. G-Force reached 6.4. The edge of the visor was shrouded in darkness, but his finger found the pickle button. The wing under bracket rang with a thud. Two JDAM ER munitions were released like birds, opening their folding carbon wings. It switched from ballistic mode to glider mode, and began to glide above the horizon line like two olive green streaks of M81. After climbing, the MiG entered a 130-degree split S, its nose scraping the ground, and at an altitude of 24 meters, it dove back into the radar tunnel. 
It would never cross the border, but the bombs would not need a visa. The T-38 GPS receiver inside had locked onto 72 channel signals. The INS laser ring gyroscopes were recording the gravity dance 10 times per second, and the tail servo fins were making 50 corrections per second to reduce wind drift to 2.6 meters. Two minutes had passed since takeoff. A midday meeting was about to begin in the concrete shell of the target headquarters. The GLONASS console flashed, link stable. The artillery officer prepared to read the grids on the screen, and the Orland 30 base in the basement uploaded the night sortie report. Amidst all this electronic clutter, a 400 millimeter thick double-walled shelter, claiming to be a bomb-proof room, was wrapped in blue like a cabbage leaf. When the JDAM ER engine entered its 17-second solid fuel thrust phase, the bombs crossed the border, with the MiG still on the side, controlled by Ukrainian forces. The glider missile hybrid was now slicing through the air at 0.92 Mach, locking its dive angle at 68 degrees and reducing its CEP value to 2.1 meters. Their RCS was as small as a seagull, sufficient to lock the radar Doppler filter into bird flock mode. The Tor M2 operator ran outside and saw a speck of light on the camera, but the algorithm under the screen gave a false alarm and did not give permission to fire. That decision would cost him two minutes. He activated the JDAM ER-1 altimeter radar 420 meters west of the target coordinates. The roof pinged at 148 meters. The delay fuse was set to 0.025 seconds. The penetrator at the tip sliced through the galvanized sheet like thin paper, pierced the concrete slab, shattered the massive basement ceiling, and the 87 Kilgaws PBXN-109 detonated with a flash of white light. The shockwave, expanding at $8,000 MIS, tore through the shelter's inner walls from the inside out, shattering the GLONASS racks, RF converter modules, and the 12 kiloloy power supply beneath the SATCOM modem. The JDAM ER-2 struck the fuel tank 0.34 seconds later. The fuel air cloud turned into a 1,300-degree plasma. A fire hose spun beneath the concrete floor, and the secondary explosion dragged the BMP-2M ammunition into the flames. The Tor M2's radar cable burned like a fuse. The electronic jamming modules of the Avtobaza M truck melted like liquid tin. Despite boasting a bomb-proof designation, the shelter's walls swelled and burst like unlabeled tin cans when internal pressure exceeded 200 PSI. In three and a half seconds, the building's floors collapsed like dominoes, and the GLONASS dish spiraled upward through the flames before crashing into the sky. The cloud of smoke rose 90 meters, then 400 meters. An American LEO satellite recorded the cement-filled black stain on the map during its first pass. OSINT ran the headline, Kursen Massive Strike, in the 15th second. The Kremlin would write its first statement two hours later, an ammunition depot fire. Although not very convincing, the statement was intended to be reassuring. But the 34th Brigade's S-300 radar records had already sealed the target-destroyed report on two bird-sized signals that appeared on the screens and disappeared within seconds. The damage toll for Russia was quantified in figures. What was inside the massive Russian military facility hit by the MiG-29? The command building, reinforced with concrete and a fiber-reinforced roof, was completely blown to pieces. This would cost Russian forces an estimated $3.3 million. GLONASS uplink antennas, a cryptographic capsule, and a K-band transmitter were also destroyed. The total cost of these items is close to $1.8 million. It is claimed that two Tor M2 systems were also eliminated. The value of these systems is at least $52 million. Four BMP-2M vehicles were also destroyed in the Russian military complex, hit by the MiG-29. These vehicles are worth a total of $12 million. The cost of the Avtobaza M electronic warfare truck is $18 million. Eight Orlan 30 packages are worth $3.6 million. ZU-23 chassis, gas SADCO trucks, fuel generators, fiber cables, drone rockets, and ammunition amount to approximately $14 million. The airstrike carried out by the Ukrainian Air Force's MiG-29 may have cost Russia a total of $104 million. The two bombs fired by the MiG-29 and the two violent explosions that followed have caused over $100 million in damage in Kherson on the Russian front. This was likely beyond the estimation of the Ukrainian Air Force, which carried out the operation. In contrast, the flight costs for this operation for the Ukrainian army include two JDAM-ER kits, 
Wing Kit Plus MK83 Body at $650,000, MIG Sortie Fuel, Maintenance, and Pilot Fees at $73,000, and Zip Tie Avionics Modifications at $18,000. The total cost amounts to approximately $741,000. The cost-effectiveness ratio is roughly 1 to 145. The example of an open-top sports car loses its meaning here. This table presents the Ukrainian army with the reality of having carried out an incredibly successful operation against Russia instead of buying a car. When the MiG touched the runway with its parachute brakes, it was not even 1 p.m. It is claimed that the operation lasted a total of 9 minutes and 52 seconds with the actual destruction taking three and a half seconds. Soviet steel, French guidance, American satellite constellations, and Ukrainian band clamp intelligence ignored the borderlines, reducing the front line's nerve network to ashes, along with a command center worth $104 million. The only sound the S-300 operator heard was the echo of nothingness. And now the question turns to a different direction. If a MiG-29, two JDAM ERs, a zip-tied iPad, and the pilot's courage can illuminate a midday moment in three seconds like the sun at a right angle, what old rules of war can stand? The radar's response is silence. The map's response is a black spot. The satellite's response is melting steel. How do you interpret this equation? Share your thoughts in the comments, subscribe to the channel, and please hit the like button. Because by the time the next send command is given, a new column of smoke may already be rising into the sky. Stay tuned to not miss it. Thank you for watching.